Man, it is good to be here. You know, it's great in like the middle of the uh, winter. There's nothing else to do in Grand Rapids except kind of hang out here together and uh, do church. And so it's, it's always good to, uh, to gather um, uh, together as a family uh, to worship on Sunday uh, together, kind of set the tone uh, for our weeks together as we kind of gather from across all the places where we're scattered throughout the week to come together to, uh, as Josh said this morning, set our affections on Jesus, have our hearts stirred with who he is, what he's done, be encouraged as we worship together as a body, and then be sent back out on mission into the city uh, together. And so uh, this winter we're doing a membership series called Membership matters. And again, uh, you may be thinking membership, you know, does anybody still do that? It's so formal and it just sounds so, um, you know, obnoxious and official. Why can't we just be more organic and more chill and just do life together and whatever? And, and so I'm trying to make the case for why this membership thing matters, why it's relevant, why it's important, why it's life-giving, why it really helps us as a church really be the church that God has called us to be, not just a church that kind of accidentally, you know, does whatever it kind of feels like doing, but, you know, are we the church that Jesus dreamed of, that Jesus built, that Jesus has released, and Jesus is sending out into the world? And so, um, uh, first week, I tried to show that membership matters because it celebrates stories of God's Salvation. In other words, membership is not about your abilities, your considerable talents, um, your great personality, and anything like that. Membership is about what God has done to bring you into his family. It's something that God has to do. It's a work of his grace. It's a story of his salvation. And, and when we bring members in, we're celebrating that. We're saying God has done something in the life of this person um, that's worth celebrating. Uh, second, we said membership matters because it fosters biblical family, right? The church is not an exclusive club where all the good people come and hang out and then look down on everybody else. The church is not this exclusive club. It's an inclusive family. Uh, it's a family that is doing life together, and it's a family that's welcoming others in. It's a family that is, we're obviously taking care of our own. We're, we're living together, we're eating meals together, we're doing life together, but uh, we want to include other people into that family. We want to welcome other people in, and so the church is family. That's how the, uh, it's a predominant metaphor for the church in the New Testament. Lots of language around the family. And then last week, I said membership matters because it mobilizes members, members for mission. And, and so this is very important. The church does not exist for itself. The church does not exist to go bless itself and help itself and take care of itself. And uh, membership in pretty much any other club, right, is for the members to kind of get benefits out of it. The church is one of, if not the only, I don't know, organization, I'm just winging this, um, that exists for the people around us, right? We exist as members of the church, not simply for ourselves, but we exist for the good of our city, of the good of our world. That's what Jesus established his church, to have eyes for uh, the nations and eyes for the world around us. And so that's the big picture, if you will, of membership, right? Why we think this is something you should be excited about. The church uh, gives us good news, right? It gives us the gospel to build our lives, right? It gives us a family to be a part of. It gives us a mission that we are a part of a bigger story that we join together with Jesus. And that's exciting, right? That's something that uh, um, if we could do that as a church, right, it would be compelling. It would be exciting. It would be uh, an adventure to be a part of. And, and so in the next um, couple weeks here, after giving you kind of the big picture, I want to get more into the nuts and bolts of um, membership, more of the practical side of what it looks like to live out this membership. And so this morning, I'm going to suggest uh, that membership matters because it mobilizes spiritual gifts for ministry and mission. Membership matters because it mobilizes spiritual gifts for ministry and mission. And so God has given the church these 
incredible gifts, and we need to unwrap them this morning and start using them here in our church and out in our city. And so uh, it's a great privilege and joy to do that. And, and I hope as you walk away this morning with that, you, you walk away with a sense of what it is that we've been given these incredible gifts uh, to bless uh, uh, the church and bless the city around us. I'm taking my text here from Ephesians 4. I'm going to be looking at verses 1 through 16. If you don't have a Bible, you just slip your hand up and you can follow right along with us. Uh, we don't put it up on the screen just because we want you to read it in the Bible. Don't take it from us. Uh, don't take it over the screen. We want you to get one of those in your hand. And besides, you may never have heard of the English Standard Version, that translation of the Bible we use. Uh, that way we've got one. We can put it in your hand. You can follow right along with us and not be confused. And so uh, if you don't have one of those Bibles, uh, it's our gift to you. You can take it. Um, we are on page uh, 812, if you are following along in those little ESV story Bibles. We're handing out again Ephesians 4. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 16. We'll pray, and then we will get underway uh, this morning. <clears throat> cool. Yeah, keep them coming. Keep those hands up. Don't, yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Again, pages 812, if you are following along, I'll let those pages flip here and you can get to where you're going, and then I'll read our text, we'll pray, and we'll get to work uh, this morning. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called, to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of God. Let's pray uh, this morning as we do get into God's Word, that God would uh, speak to us through His Word. Father, we come uh, this morning uh, out of our busy lives and routines and schedules and the uh, frenetic pace of life in the 21st century uh, uh, to come and just settle our hearts this morning, uh, to be reminded of who you are and what you've done, and uh, uh, to hear from you and uh, what you would have to say for us in your Word. And so I pray this morning that uh, just something of the wonder of these gifts would land on us, uh, something of the joy of, of being given gifts to serve uh, uh, those around us here in the church and those outside in the city, uh, that would land on us this morning, that we would uh, really be able to consider the gifts you've given uh, to us, and that as a church, more and more we would come to recognize those gifts, discover them, and use them. Uh, to bless uh, our church and bless our city. And so I uh, pray this morning that you'd come and you'd speak uh, to your people through your Holy Spirit. pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So my aim for this morning's message is to activate our spiritual gifts for ministry and mission. I want to 
activate our spiritual gifts for ministry and mission. So I don't just want to tell you what they were or are. I, I want you to use them. I want you to put them to work here in our ministry for your joy and for God's glory. And I think those two things are uh, going to go together uh, for us. And so if you're taking notes, I'm really just going to be answering three questions this morning. And the first is, what are spiritual gifts? Obviously, it would be important to establish first. Why are spiritual gifts so important? Why do they keep coming up in Paul's letters to the churches uh, that he keeps saying, hey, you should, you should learn what these things are? And then how does membership mobilize spiritual gifts for ministry and mission? And so, so what are spiritual gifts? Let me start with a definition for you, if that helps. Uh, some of you like definitions. Um, spiritual gifts are Christ-bought, spirit-empowered abilities graciously given to each member of the body of Christ to help it grow in size and maturity. That's the definition that I came up with. And what I want to do essentially is I'm going to just unpack that definition and where I see it here in Ephesians chapter 5. Each of those statements in there I'm taking directly from uh, our text. And so the first is Christ bought. Spiritual gifts are Christ bought uh, gifts. And so what I want you to see first in our text is that Paul wants to draw our attention to the gifts that Christ gives to us. So uh, we see here, right in verse 7, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then he quotes Psalm 68. He says, uh, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. And so what Paul wants to draw our attention to here in Psalm 68 is this picture right of a king who has triumphed over all his enemies, and he's leading his prisoners and all the spoils of the war behind him up to the capital city, and he is about to come as the victor then to distribute these gifts to, the, to those that have prevailed, those that have conquer, conquered, those that have triumphed. And so Paul's alluding to this great uh, chapter in Psalm 68 where the psalmist is praying for God's victory to come and God to deliver his people just like he did in the Exodus. And then he ascended to Mount Sinai in his glory and his power and as king over his people and gave gifts to them. Paul is saying that is exactly what Jesus has done in his death and resurrection. Uh, Jesus in his death and resurrection conquered sin, death, and Satan. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father, and now he is distributing to his church kingly gifts uh, for them to enjoy. And we're recipients of those gifts, right? Each person who's a member of the body of Christ, part of the church, receives gifts from the risen and reigning Christ. And these are kingly gifts that Jesus provides. And so it really should be like Christmas every time the church gets together, right? Because we're opening up all of these presents that God has given us and, and those gifts that we're celebrating together, right? They, like when new people come to the church, it's like those gifts just keep coming, right? As new members come in, we're like, man, a new present right, from God, a person with new, unique gifts that will come and contribute, help the body grow. And, and those gifts, they just keep giving, right? Because, you know, once you've been given this spiritual gift, right, you get to use it to serve the body of Christ. And so uh, I want you to get a vision here, right, of uh, when you're thinking about spiritual gifts, think of Jesus who's alive right now, who's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's ruling and he's reigning, right? And he's given each one of you, member of the body, a, a gift to help the church grow both in size and maturity. There are a lot of different gifts. We're going to get into that, but I want you to see that these are kingly gifts, right? This should be like Christmas every time we get together, when we meet together in homes, when we serve together in the city. We're just recognizing the gifts that God has given us in the people around us. And the second thing I want you to note is that they are spirit-empowered. And, and I'm kind of cherry-picking that from another text because the spirit isn't mentioned. But since I'm talking about spiritual gifts, I thought it would be kind of important to highlight the, the spirit part of them. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump over to 1 Corinthians 12, the other classic text on spirit. Just read that for you so you understand uh, these are gifts given by Christ, uh, but they're they're actually worked out in our lives through the Holy Spirit. They're empowered by the Holy Spirit. So 1 Corinthians 12, you don't have to flip over there. I'll just read verses 7 through 11. Paul says, To each is given the manifestation of the 
spirit for the common good. For one is given through the spirit the utter of wis- utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, uh, to another gifts of healing by the spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another abil- ability to distinguish spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of spirits. All of these are, here's the word, empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. And so these are not merely natural abilities. They're not natural gifts, natural strengths that you took the strength finder test. You go, these are my natural propensities and abilities. The two are not utterly unrelated, but these are spiritual gifts. These are gifts given by the Holy Spirit. You may work in one field and your vocation, your career, your calling may be in one direction. And in the church, you may be doing something else. Just because you work in finance doesn't mean you have to be the church bookkeeper. Maybe you will be, and that would be awesome. We always need more help with that. But, <clears throat> but you know, that's not necessarily the case, right? There are people that, you know, work as executives and then are also in children's ministry, working with the kids, and God is using those gifts, right? And so, you know, the gifts that necessarily you may be studying in college may not necessarily be your gifts because it's a spiritual gift um, that can augment your natural abilities, that can obviously work in alignment with your natural abilities too, but don't confuse the two. They're not one and the same. They are spiritual gifts given uh, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, this third thing I'd like you to notice is that they are graciously given. And I say that because Paul says right here in verse 7, but grace was given to each one according to the measure of Christ's gift. Paul very explicitly in this text wants to identify spiritual gifts as grace. And in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, he actually coins a Greek word. Uh, it's charismata, which is actually uh, a combination of two words, the Greek word for grace and the Greek word for gift. So he's saying these are grace gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12. Um, grace gifts here in Ephesians, they're just grace. These gifts that you've been given are grace to you. And of course, you know, charismatic is where we get that common word charismatic, which, you know, is typically thought of in highly miraculous, supernatural giftings, but really they're just grace giftings, graciously given by God, freely given by God uh, to help the church grow and minister together. And so uh, because these gifts are grace, because they're freely given, because we didn't earn them, because we aren't entitled to like have a certain amount of gifts, Um, we really shouldn't have anything to brag about or be ashamed of, right, in relation uh, to our gifts. The problem with the church in Corinth is that some people thought they were superior because of their gifts, and some people thought they were inferior because of the gifts they were given. The ones that were up on stage doing the really extraordinary work thought they were going, they were were the ones, right? They were the the spiritual people. And then those people that were serving and doing mercy and other, they were just not as significant as, and important. And that's why grace is so foundational for our understanding of spiritual gifts. It undercuts the pride and superiority that so easily goes with some of the more visible gifts. And it also undercuts the shame and inferiority that that tends to, to grab hold of the people that are like, gosh, I got dealt that gift. Like, I don't want that thing. I don't want to be the guy that's serving. I don't want to be doing all the helping and administrating and you know, I want to be up there, I want to be, be up there in the front, in the forefront of things. And yet, if, if gifts are grace, if they're given by God for our good and His glory, if they're, they're freely given for us to serve, right, grace should shape the way we think about our gifts uh, profoundly. I mean, you may be persuaded that you are the most gifted person in the room this morning and be useless for ministry because grace hasn't shaped the way you think about your gift, right? Nothing is more destructive to a church than pride and arrogance and entitlement and people that are incredibly gifted and think because of that, you know, they should be elevated, right? That, that's the very thing that disqualifies you from ministry. You also may be persuaded that you're the most ungifted person in the church this morning. You're like, I got nothing to offer. I mean, the fact that I showed up here is impressive enough. And that's not true either. That is a lie, right? God has given you kingly gifts to use to serve in the church. Uh, Tim Keller uh, just sums this up so well. Uh, I love what he said. He says, unless you understand the greater importance of grace and gospel character for ministry effectiveness, the discernment and use of spiritual gifts may actually become a liability 
in your ministry. And I'd say it's stronger than that. Not only may become a liability, it will become a liability because I've seen it happen. And it's, it's messy and it's not good. Uh, character, gospel are essential. I mean, absolutely essential. The, the, the nature of the gifts being gifts of God's grace shapes absolutely everything. And so, so do you see spiritual gifts in that way? You see them as an expression of God's grace to you? Do you, do you desire spiritual gifts? You're kind of like, yeah, that's something for ministry people that do, and you know, but that's not for me. Right? Right? Spiritual gifts are something that we need to think about more as uh, a church. Do you see the gifts as a blessing or a burden? Maybe you think, Spiritual gifts just mean I need to serve more. I need to do more. I need to work more. If you're seeing spiritual gifts as a burden, you're really not understanding the nature of a spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts, by their very nature, are life-giving to the church and they're life-giving to you. When you're serving out of your gifting, of your ability, you're able to bless others, and there's nothing more rewarding than that in uh, the church. Uh, The next thing I want you to see, not only are spiritual gifts um, Christ-bought, Spirit-empowered, um, and graciously given their abilities, right? That, that should be somewhat obvious. But here in Ephesians, these abilities are represented by people with these gifts. And there are, are five groups of people with these gifts listed here in Ephesians. We see that in verse 11, right? Um, he was descended da, 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 as the one who gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. So five groups of people um, that... Paul wants to highlight. And so what I'm going to do is I just want to go through some of these giftings. I'll just give you a short synopsis, short description. And I've, I've borrowed some of this from Tim Keller because he's got some great descriptions here, summed it up really nicely. Uh, not afraid to steal from somebody who knows what they're talking about. Um, but I'm going to give you some synopsis. I want you to be thinking, is this me? Like, is this, is this relate to who I am, what I'm doing? Um, and how could I begin to think about serving in the church? So let's talk about some of the abilities that are listed here as spiritual gifts. Well, the first one is the apostle. And so that's always kind of interesting. Anybody an apostle out there? You know, that can get really confusing when people want to start calling themselves apostles. We've got to be really clear that there are no apostles today, okay? There were like 12 of them. And if you add like Paul to that, 13, like these guys like wrote the Bible. Whoa. <laughs> Are we okay? We're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Having babies, make sure the baby is okay first, and then we will move on with the sermon here. <laughs> this, is, this is important. Okay. Where was I? talking about apostles, right? There are no apostles uh, today. And so to be an apostle, you had to be an eyewitness of Jesus. You had to walk with him. You were like chosen by Jesus. And so uh, there's a very select group of those kind of people. And so uh, to to talk about apostles today can be very confusing, very unhelpful, uh, not a good thing. Let's steer away from that. But there is a gift um, that Paul talks about even in this very chapter, in uh, chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, Uh, of a missionary. And so if you look here, just back in chapter 3, starting verse 7, Paul says that this gift of this gospel is a minister according to the gift of God's grace which is given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace is given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so there is a gift I'll call it a missionary gift and call it apostolic in the most generic sense. The word apostle in its more generic sense just means sent one or missionary, church planner. You could put it in those categories. And so there are people that have been uniquely gifted uh, by God uh, with an ability to start new things, to bring the culture across cultures, to plant churches, to be missionaries, to be pioneering, to be out there on the front line. And yeah, you know, think of a guy like Kempton Turner, who we brought here as a church planner from Bethlehem. He just picked up and dropped himself down into East St. Louis, one of the most dangerous cities in the country, doing a significant cross-cultural ministry, starting a work from scratch, a pioneering thing. He was setting out as a missionary, and that's a gifting we need, right? We need people that are willing to take the gospel to new people. As a church plant, we want to raise up lots of church planters that are going to have this this gift that Paul had, this missionary gift to take the gospel to people that don't know about him yet. Whether that's here or halfway around the world, we need people with this kind of gifting. Uh, The second gift Paul mentions here is the prophet. 
Now, prophets are people that know God's word and they call people to obedience and repentance. They, they apply God's word in a very convicting, very relevant, very applicable way, right? They, they have a gift of speaking God's word, so it's convicting. It cuts you right to the heart, right? We, we've joked around in the church about getting quaned, right? You know, you've been cornered by quan. Like, you know, sometimes he just speaks into your life in such a way that you're like, gosh, I'm that guy. You know, if you, if you hang out with Micah, right, or Butch, those guys, they're direct, right? They'll be like, here's what the Bible says. What, let's do that. Like, that's really important. That's a value. That's a significant gift uh, that we need in our church. People that are willing to just speak God's word and call us to repentance, call us to obedience, call us to live it out. You know, you think of guys like Francis Chan, right? Francis is great. He gets them, the Bible says it. <laughs> Why aren't we doing it? Like that, <laughs> that's a prophet. So evangelists are, are great. And, and I love evangelists because I'm not really a great one of them. Evangelists relate to people well, right? They have an eye for people that are on the outside, right? They, they're good at building relationships, rapport and trust with people that don't know Jesus. They're good at communicating the gospel winsomely. They're, they're the kind of people that bring people, right? They're always hanging out. They're always meeting new people. Uh, they're always making new connections. They're like, hey, hey, why don't you come out to Young Life? Why don't you come out to Crew? Why don't you be a part of my Bible study? Why don't you come to my church? Like, that's an evangelist, right? They're, they're natural networkers, but they do it with gospel intentionality. They're people that are just natural connectors. They move around there. And, and I will say, as a church, we need more evangelists, right? We need more people that are like that, that are just out there. They're like, man, we're leaving this comfort of church. We're going to go out there and reach new people. Like, you guys can hang out here in the holy huddle, man. We're getting out there, and we're going to reach people for Jesus. That's an evangelist, right? We need more evangelists. Uh, uh, the fourth one here, and the second two, shepherds and teachers, are kind of connected. They're related gift mixes, and so uh, grammatically, you know, it could be one and the same gift. I think it's kind of two perspectives on ministry here, but the shepherds and the teachers, and some people are shepherd teachers, some people are teacher shepherds, um, some people have more and more teachers, more shepherds, but the two gifts are, are related, but they're also distinct, and shepherds are, are pastors, right? They, they shepherd the flock. They take care of people. They, they love on people. Um, they're about soul care. And, and I think of guys like John Holderbaugh. I don't know if he's in here, but John is always like, Mike, how's your heart doing, man? How are you growing? You know, how's your relationship with Jesus? How are you walking? And if you hang out with guys like Kevin uh, Voss, he's all, how are you doing? You know, what's your heart like? I, I, I love hanging out with those guys. Chris Arnest, those guys, they'll draw you out. They want to know how you're doing. They, they have this distinctively kind of priestly function. They're, they're really willing to listen to who you are, where you're at, what you're going. We need people like that, right, to care for the flock. Some of you guys are in counseling, right? That's what you do. You sit down with your people. You love to walk with them and alongside of them. That's what shepherds do. You want to help people grow. You want to bring them to growth, maturity, health. That's just the way you are wired, right? We need shepherds in the church. And then finally, uh, teachers, right? Teachers make the Bible clear, accessible, understandable, and applicable to everyday life, right? Teachers don't make the the simple complex, they make the complex simple, right? They take uh, God's word and they make it understandable for the rest of us. Uh, teachers love theology, doctrine, curriculum. You know you met a teacher when you have a problem, like here's a book, you know? <laughs> here, read this curriculum, do this thing here. You know, I've, I've got a website or a blog I could send you to. That, that's kind of the teaching input. And I drive people nuts like that. I've got a book for every problem in my extensive library because I love, you know, I love that teaching. That's something, I mean, I just nerd out about all this you know, stuff and I, and I love it. And we need teachers as well to, to bring us back to the scriptures uh, teach us what it says, what's God heart, God's heart for us uh, to follow. Uh, but these aren't the only gifts, right? These are word ministry gifts. Uh, we could call prophetic gifts. They're, they're, they're the gift of gab, as Tim Keller says, you know. Uh, and, and some of us are wired like that, but some of us aren't. And so uh, it's important to see that there's another spectrum of gifts out there, and uh, you may identify more with these. And, and by the way, if you're looking for the lists, uh, they're really easy to remember, that's Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, so two 12s, and then Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 4. So easy to remember. Those are the four lists. There's, you know, 20-some gifts in there, not probably an exhaustive list. All the lists are different. The order is different. And so it seems like 
you know, the apostles are giving us some, a selection, a sampling of some gifts that we should be considering. And, and so let me just give you a couple more of these gifts to look at. Let's look more at like the serving gifts or the priestly gifts. I want you to notice this. There's the gift of serving, right? That's the word uh, formally is used for deacons, those that serve. Uh, maybe the classic example would be Acts 6, uh, those that took charge of serving uh, the food to the Grecian widows. Apostle, like, we're going to devote ourselves to prayer and to the word. And these other guys said, we'll take care of serving the widows uh, that need uh, food distributed to them. Uh, you know, servants, they serve. They want to get things done. They want to meet the practical, material needs of people in ways that bear spiritual fruit. Maybe you say, look, I'm not, I'm not a teacher. I'm not a pastor. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not a shepherd. But I love to meet the material needs of people. I just like to do things. Don't, don't sit me down to talk. Let me help somebody. Uh, that's what deacons do. They serve in a lot of the behind-the-scenes functions to make things happen. A uh, gift of helps uh, is another one. It's the ability to provide assistance and support uh, to someone else, to maximize someone else's gifts, right? These, these people make things happen behind the scenes, right? They, they play a support role in the lives of people and provide incredible amount of help. I, I think of a guy like, like Joseph Martin, who is always helping out behind the scenes. If you got your tax statements out this year, uh, two weeks earlier than normal, or maybe a month earlier than normal, it's because we have guys behind the scenes who are like, how can I come alongside, make this process happen? How can I streamline this system? Like, how can I just whip this thing into shape? Because it needs a little bit of organization. I could see you need help. You're a little disorganized. You know, how can we do this better? That's the gift of, of helps. Um, also, the gift of healing here, which uh, we, we could become a little squeamish at, right? You've got all the televangelists out there doing their healing ministries, and then you've got, you know, normal churches are kind of like, well, we're just going to bag off on that a little bit. You know, and, and yet, biblically speaking, right, people get healed. Jesus heals people. We read it in the book of Acts. We know it still happens today. We know it's not a guarantee. You know, we're not going to have, uh, you know, go on a healing tour or anything like that. But there are people that God um, God heals, and we can't deny that. It's not only a spiritual gift, it's in the book of James, right? People are sick, you know, they're to come to the elders. The elders are anoint them with oil and pray over them, and, and God heals. And we have to recognize that that is a reality today, and that's something we shouldn't take for granted. God um, still heals. Uh, giving or generosity. It's important for you guys to understand the gift of, uh, of giving or generosity is not the ability to earn lots of money, per se, right? You may look and say, hey, I, you look at my bank account, I clearly don't have the gift of giving. You know, the gift of giving does not require you to be rich. The gift of giving requires you to see the practical needs around you and then respond, you know, financially, with practical resources, with practical help. You know, you have the gift of giving. You see a need and you are on it. I mean, there are people in our church that have told me, like, preemptively, like, if you see a need, please contact me so I can send money to those people. And I'm just like, whoa, that is the gift. That's the gift of generosity. And those people like to remain anonymous. So I'm not going to point them all out here either. Uh, but gift of giving, uh, a gift of mercy is the ability to love the unlovely, to alleviate suffering, to wade into the messiness and brokenness of life in a way that bears spiritual fruit. I, I think of Erica Mariglia, who you know, works down at Mel Trotter. Uh, she's, you know, neck deep in working with the homeless. And I'm just wading into stuff where I'm just like, I'm in way over my head. Like, I don't know what to do. Like, I mean, the problems are so big and so broken, and I, there's not a book for that. You know, <laughs> there needs to be people that are waiting. And that's what people like Erica do, and there are other people in our church like that is just a heart for mercy, that love to minister, to love the unlovely, to, to wade into the brokenness and messiness uh, of life. Uh, there's the gift of miracles. And again, you know, we go, oh my gosh, here we go. Uh, Miracles, that's a gift, you know, that happens. And again, I'd say some churches are really obsessed with that. You know, everything's about the miracles, all the supernatural gifts. Woohoo, we're going to do miracles and knock people over and cool. And then other churches are like, God doesn't do miraculous stuff anymore. It's just God, Jesus, and the Holy Bible. You know, we don't, we don't even have a Holy Spirit. We're too scared if he's going to do anything. And so uh, we've got to recognize again that like, you know, God is the God of miracles. He's alive. He's moving. He's active. The Holy Spirit is moving in our lives and in the church, and he's the source of our power and the spiritual gifts and conversion and any number of miracles that he feels like he should do on a given day. And so we're not, as a church, going to obsess about miracles, but we're not going to ignore them either because God is the God of the miraculous. Heck, he rose Jesus, raised Jesus from the dead. That, that's the kind of faith we believe in. It's a faith 
of miracles. Uh, hospitality is another gift. The ability to welcome and refresh the stranger, right? You don't necessarily have to have like a mansion to host people in, but you just have this ability to welcome people in from the outside, strangers, welcome them in to your home or even take them out to dinner in such a way that they just feel cared for, refreshed, at ease. Um, If you've ever been to dinner parties by the Vosses or Zaninis, like, you know, you've been, you've experienced this gift of hospitality. You've been welcomed into this incredible uh, meal and this experience and relationships. And you go, wow, that's, that's hospitality. That's, that's the gift at work. And then tongues. I don't have time to talk about tongues. Boy, that's a long, that's a long conversation. Let me give you the short order. You can have coffee with me afterwards on this one. But in the book of Acts, the gift of tongues is speaking in a foreign language, okay? So that's speaking in a foreign language is what is happening in Acts. What I think in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, and the gift of tongues in uh, the book of 1 Corinthians and the gift as a, and the tongues as a gift, um, what I want to argue is that it's a way to pray. It's a form of prayer. Uh, what Tim Keller calls just, it's free vocalization, something uh, analogous to, you know, vocalizing and singing when you're just kind of making noise there. It's, it's a gift. It's a, it's a prayer language that you give to God. And when it's interpreted, it becomes kind of a prophecy. And, and so tongues are uh, a prayer language, if you will, um, that God gives to certain people, not to other people. And I think what's tripped a lot of people up is some traditions, right, make tongues like the sign that you're in the church. You've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. You're really a part of the church. And Paul makes it very clear that that some people are going to have this gift, some people are not going to have this gift. Maybe you relate to God in that regard, right? You pray in tongues and it's a great ministry to you and encouragement in your personal life. And maybe you don't, and that's fine too, because it's a gift and not everybody's going to have the gift. And that's really short and you can talk to me later if you're really confused now about that. Um, Moving on to some of the leadership gifts. Uh, There are a couple here. I'm going to highlight four of them. The first is government and leadership. Uh, a, leadership, a leader is someone who gets people to follow you, right? It's pretty much simple as that, right? If, you know, a leader, somebody, the gift of leadership is someone who gets people to follow them. And so there are a lot of people in positions of authority, maybe your boss, maybe somewhere around. They are leaders in the sense that they are like your bosses. They're over you, but they're not leaders in the sense that no one follows them, like they have to follow them. But, you know, no one really follows them. And then there are people, right, you know in your life that don't have an official title or designation, but, like, people follow them, right? When they lead, people follow. You might fall them off a cliff, but, you know, you know, it could follow them in a good direction too, right? I mean, they have the gift of leadership when they lead, people uh, follow. And that's a gift um, from God, obviously, when you are leading people in the right direction. And we need leaders, right? If we're going to move forward as a church, You know, we need more leaders in our church. And I would say, highlight this, both men and women ministry, right? We need leaders in both departments. Christy Voss has stepped up and done a fantastic job leading our women's ministry. And that's really important to see women stepping up. It's important to see men stepping up to lead in the work of the gospel here in our city. Uh, We also need this gift of administration. Um, Administrators... uh, are people that, like, they figure out the best way to get things done, right? You know, somebody has got the big vision, they got the dream, they got the idea. They're the ones that are actually going to implement it. They're going to, how do we get from plan to implementation? How do we get from, like, we've got this huge vision to, like, working it out in the nitty-gritty on the ground, right? You have, you have the people that are more the visionary leader people that are casting this huge vision, and they're just like, who cares about the details? We're going to go take this hill. And then you have the people that are kind of like, all right, here's what we're going to do. Here's the tactic, strategy. Here's the plan. Here's where we're actually going to get to where we need to go. We need people with the gift of administration. Also need people with the gift of, gift of wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to solve problems, sort out complex challenges, and come up with helpful solutions, right? Uh, as our church grows, right, it's become increasingly complex. And you think, well, it's only like 100 people. Like, I mean, how is that complex? You'd be surprised behind the scenes, all the discussions, conversations that happen, and not to mention all this really challenging interpersonal situations, pain, brokenness that people are going through. We need people with wisdom to be able to step in and kind of untie all those issues. They all get knotted up and get confused. And then I'll, then I'll close maybe with faith. Faith is the ability to set goals with tremendous confidence, to set vision, to dream. Uh, it's a person with incredible 
optimism. They just have a sense of what Jesus is doing. They just want to do it, right? It's an incredible faith. Jesus would love for us to be here doing this, doing that. And we need people with faith who are just willing to set out. And of course, we need the administrators who are going, hmm, how's that actually going to happen and work and do that? But we need people with faith that are willing to have some big dreams and, you know, think about, wow, we could do this and we could do that. We need people that are thinking big. You know, certainly the one thing we don't need in our church culture is just another group of people that are just going to sit on their hands and, you know, go through the motions, right? We need people that are thinking outside the box, that have that gift of faith, that recognize Jesus is alive, he's on the move, he's building his church, and, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so, those are a sampling of the gifts there for you. And it took a while on that. I'm a teacher. I want you to be able to find your place in, that, in those designations. It's not an exhaustive gift. Maybe you didn't feel like any of those nailed you, but, but there are areas in your life where you're maybe sensing that. Um, did any of those stick out? And, and what I want to close off on here in this kind of segment here is that they're given to each of us. That, that was the last kind of piece of our of our definition there that I got to, right? They're Christ-bought, spirit-empowered, graciously given abilities given to each member of the body of Christ. And so each of you has got one of these gifts. You've, you've got one. It's not just for pastors, not just for people in full-time ministry, the missionaries, evangelists, not just for the people on stage, you know, leading worship or whatever. Everyone, if you are a Christian, has a gift. And it's important to recognize that that just because you have a gift doesn't mean you don't have to do anything else now. It's kind of interesting in the New Testament, all of the gifts are also <laughs> given to, as a responsibility to all believers. So we're all told to do evangelism. Some people are going to be incredibly gifted. We all get to do evangelism. Some people have the gift of giving, but we're all called to give generously. Some people have the gift of serving, but we're all called to serve generally. And that applies to pretty much every single gift. And so just because you've got a gift doesn't mean, well, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to serve here, serve there. You know, as a church plant, we're always like, there are always places where some of you just got to jump in, roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty. And, and that's okay too. Uh, but as we grow and we see more of these gifted people coming and being a part of the church and we put people in the right places, we're going to see uh, great growth, I think, both in size and uh, maturity. And so, again, you've been given a gift. You have one in this church. And so uh, we have this incredible opportunity to steward those gifts um, together and for um, your joy and for God's glory. And so why are spiritual gifts so important? I told you what spiritual gifts are, right? These cross-bought, spirit-enabled, graciously given abilities that every member of the body of the church has. Why are they so important for you? What I want you to see is that spiritual gifts are so important because they're designed to help the body grow into the fullness of Christ. So notice first what Paul says in verse 12. And I'm going to start reading in verse 11. He says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, notice, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And so what the leadership of the church is there to do is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And that would be you. Right, that's how Paul opens up the book of Ephesians that we're in. He's like, I want to, uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, all of those who are set apart, right, to be following Jesus, be a part of his ministry in the world, right? You're all saints, right? We're, we're, and you're on the college where the mascot is the saints, <laughs> quite as college. So it's great. You know, we're, we're all saints, right? That's a very profoundly biblical idea. Um, we are all saints. We're all set apart for Jesus, for ministry. And, and that Paul calling that Paul has for he's saying every member, every member is a minister. You say, you know, it's Grand Rapids. We have a ministerial associations. And, you know, the ministers are the guys who go to seminary and wear suits and ties. Not according to Paul, right? You have been called to do the work of ministry. Every member is a minister. That's the leadership is designed to do, help you discover uh, what your gift is and get you off the bench into the game, so to speak, of ministry and life uh, together. Uh, and that's exciting. It's so good to know that I don't have to have all the gifts. You know, if you know me very well, I don't have all the gifts, right? I don't, the elders do not have all the gifts, right? Our leadership teams, the men and women do not have all the gifts, right? But together, right, as God is calling out every member to be a part of ministry, we actually can begin to do what God is calling us 
uh, to do. And, and I just suggest in our culture, clerical ministry is killing us. Like this idea that the pastor does everything, um, right? You know, you think, well, that's a great idea. That's what we're paying him for. I mean, for crying out loud, like you better be working hard. But there's a limitation, right, to what this person can do. If you put it all in one guy, he's got a gift mix, and that's all you're going to get, right? And that's about the most. And I would suggest, I'd make the bold, that's why so many churches are closing, right? We talked last week about how uh, 80% of churches in this country are plateaued or declining right now. That, you know, we have, you know, three to 5,000 churches closing a year. And I would suggest that one of the main reasons that is, is because of clerical ministry. We have churches that are run by one guy and maybe a staff of people that are running around trying to do all the ministry, where Paul's vision is that every member is a ministry. Every member would be unleashed to serve and do ministry in the church. And when that happens, right, the gospel runs, the gospel advances, the church grows and move forward. And I would suggest that a lot of the problem, right, that we, that the church in general sees is, is not unleashing members for ministry. And so uh, that's something that we need as a leadership team, right? We need those apostles, prophet, evangelists, teachers, shepherds. We need those folks on our men's team, we need on our women's team. Uh, we need deacons. That's something we're going to be talking about in our family meeting. We need people that are really helping uh, serve our church well behind the scenes, getting things done. We need people with those leadership gifts and those abilities as well uh, for the church to be uh, the church. Uh, but I would also suggest not only um, do, uh, does every member ministry help the church grow in the pragmatic sense of the word, but more profoundly, every member ministry helps the church grow into the fullness of Christ. And this is what's really beautiful. And I hope this lands on you. I know I'm like running out of time already and I'm like, Got another hour or so to go. So I'm going to wrap this up. But, but uh, in verse 13 or verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Now get this. This is the vision here, okay? This is Paul's vision. I think it's a beautiful one. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro, by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful seams. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Do you, do you see this vision here? Paul is saying, right, that Jesus has, you know, all of the gifts. And, and in the church, you know, each of us have little expressions of those gifts that Jesus has given. And for the church to grow up into the fullness and the stature of Jesus, to build each other up in love the way we're supposed to, everybody's got to be involved. Um, the church, with all of these myriad expressions of the gifts of Jesus, right, has to work together, has to serve together uh, to be able to bring all these gifts together. And the result here is, is beautiful, right? When every, men, every member is involved, right, uh, we don't get tossed around by every wind of doctrine anymore, right? It's verse 14, right? We're stable. We know what God says, and we're not just getting tossed around by every new teaching and idea that comes out. Right? We, we begin to really see, you know, the kind of ministry where we're speaking the truth in love. Right? We got people that speak truth. We got the prophets. And we got people that speak in love. We got the shepherds. And those people are working together and they're growing and they're learning from each other. And we have a ministry like that. We need upfront people. We need behind the scenes people. We need people laboring to pastor the flock. We need those willing to leave the 99 to seek the lost sheep. We need the full range of spiritual gifts at work together in our church for this to become the beautiful vision that Jesus has, right? A church uh, fully gifted with all of Jesus' gifts. And when it fails at that, the church just becomes a parody of itself, right? You know, if it's a teaching church, it's just like a Bible study fellowship. Like, you know, they just hang around, study the Bible all the time. It's a prophetic church. I mean, it's just everybody just calling each other out and being like, this is what we're doing. And, you know, it's like five people there because it's like, you know, they, everybody else has gotten called out. And, you know, uh, the evangelistic church isn't even here because they're like, man, there are people right now that need Jesus on Sunday morning. Why are we sitting around here in church in the morning? We should be out there reaching people that need Jesus and your shepherds that all be having a support group somewhere and, you know, a care and share time. And, you know, the church is all of those things. And that's what makes, that's the genius of the church. That's what makes the church what the church 
is. And so uh, do you have that vision? If you're considering membership here at Redemption Share, if you are a member, you know, this every member ministry, every person using the gifts Jesus has given them uh, so that we could grow up into the fullness of who Jesus is. Gosh, and that's point two. So I don't know how to finish things, this thing up here. Point three is this, and I'm going to do it really quickly, is that membership helps us then mobilize our people for ministry. And one of the things you see in the New Testament is it, you read these texts and you'll go, well, how do I figure out what my spiritual gift is? I have no idea. And the assumption when I said the New Testament seemed, didn't seem real concerned about that. They're like, you don't need to take like a test or something, and we have some of those you can take. Uh, but the assumption in the New Testament is that you get involved with the trenches of ministry, right? If you get involved behind the scenes of the church, if you get involved in the messiness of community, if you get out on mission with Jesus, if you get down into the trenches, right, you're going to figure out pretty quickly what your gift is. If you sit on the bench on Sunday morning and kind of warm a chair, you know, you're probably never going to figure out what your gift is. Uh, but as you're getting out there, as you're getting in the mix, right, you're going to discover uh, what your gift is. And, and as we begin to discover those gifts, right, as a church, we can go, hey, we got people doing this. We could start to mobilize ministry and mission uh, around that, and the city can be uh, ministered, and the church can be built, built up. Uh, and so that's my overview. Membership helps us organize, helps us mobilize, it helps us activate members, it helps us identify gifts, it helps us to be able to really strategically think about as a church, who has God brought into our church? How can we move out with the vision Jesus has uh, for us? So just imagine what it would look like if we had a leadership team that reflected, right, the list here in Ephesians 4. We had these, you know, pioneering missionary types. We had these prophetic truth speakers. We had these evangelists. We had uh, the teachers. We had the shepherds all working together to build the body of Christ. Imagine a every member ministry. I mean, can you imagine a church that represented the fullness of Jesus to our city, right, that had all of those gifts on display? It would be uh, an incredible thing, and it would unleash an incredible amount of growth here and uh, incredible blessing for our city. Uh, the bottom line is that without the spiritual gifts, right, the church is going to die, right? It's going to continue that plateaued and declining trend. Uh, but when the church is mobilized, the gifts of its members for ministry and mission, uh, the church will grow, the city will be renewed, and the world uh, impacted for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for... Uh, your word and uh, how sweet it is for us to read and hear of the gifts you've given to us. And now I pray uh, as, we, as we have time to gather around um, your table that there'd be time to consider uh, the many uh, beautiful gifts that you have given us and what they mean uh, to our church and our city. Uh, would you raise up many here uh, for the glory of your name? And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so as we gather